Pop oh, I see. Yeah. And we're live. Hello, Christophe Ponce. How are you? Hello, Justine. Thank you very much. I'm very <laughs> Hello, everybody, and very welcome. Happy to be here. I'm very happy to have you, and you can see I have company here as well. She, yeah, she's, a, cool. she loves the camera. <laughs> Come on, get out of here, you. Um, so, how do you pronounce your name, anyway? Is it Ponce or Ponce? Uh, the, the French way of pronouncing it is uh, Christophe Ponce, but usually uh, in in English it gives uh, Chris, Christophe Ponce. Right, that's and how I've been used to it. You know. Yeah, I almost I almost thought it was Ponche, but that wouldn't be French. That would be this, no, no. This... In French, you say Ponce. Ponce. Okay, yeah. very good. And welcome everybody. If you're just joining, I have Christophe uh, Ponce here uh, with me, and I'm very excited. Uh, ah, I first for some strange reason I cannot hear you anymore. Uh, sorry. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Hold on one second. That's okay. Okay, came back. It came back. Know. Yeah, sure. That's okay. We're we're in Mercury retrograde still, so you know I think we have like a couple of more days of Mercury retrograde. So these mm. things have the potential to happen. Either that or my cat probably knocked out a one. <laughs> exactly. It's okay now. Yeah, okay. So I first heard of you um, through your tarot deck. You know yeah. this beautiful uh, deck of cards that I got uh, from. Eve Renaud a long time ago. It's long out of print now, uh, but it's really yeah. one of the, the more beautiful uh, decks that I have in my collection. I also would see your name a lot uh, when I was researching tarot. Um, you know, some of your papers would come up and things like that. So I, I became interested, it followed a bit of your work, saw some things that you were interested in. Uh, and then I saw you were working on a book yeah. Um, and you have a, an amazing documentary as well. So okay. it's, yeah, really, really cool. So anyway, thank you for joining me. Um, and uh, how are you doing today? How's, how's everything going? I'm, I'm, I'm great. I'm fine. Uh, thank you very much. And, and, Good. Uh, yes, I'm happy that you, you mentioned the, the tarot deck because um, um, it, it, it came uh, in my life uh, um, when I was preparing the documentary that we made. And uh, at that time, we needed a tarot deck uh, which would be faithful to uh, the original Conver design, uh, but which would be easier to film because uh, it's difficult to film uh, like these old facsimiles when they are all stained and, uh, and the colors mixed up a, li li a little. And so we needed a really, really big and clean deck. And that's why we, yeah. we, we made this deck. Yeah, and it's also bigger too, which is, that, that answers actually some of my questions that's about the deck. Reason. I we had no idea. <laughs> Yeah, I had no idea. Well, before we get into talking about your tarot uh, and your work, just tell us a little bit about yourself, who you, know, who you are, what you've been working on lately, what, what's keeping you busy at the moment, things like that. Well, I'm, I'm busy working on, always on my research, which is uh, really the, the, the thing that drives me. And it's uh, a research on the Tarot of Marseille Arcana. Uh, which uh, I'm uh, uh, investigating uh, on uh, both an iconographical uh, point of view and also historical and philosophical. And uh, this has kept me busy for a long time and will still keep me busy for a long time. But uh, um, this gave me the, the occasion to do this documentary. And now I'm, I'm preparing a book in three volumes that will uh, sum up all of that uh, research. And um, it all started when I, uh, when I was 19, so quite uh, some time ago, it was in, uh, in the 80s, at the beginning of the 80s, uh, when a friend of mine, uh, oh, my girlfriend at that time, she <laughs> offered me a tarot deck. And so I, I started reading the cards. I, I was really amazed by the, the power of these, uh, these images, and, uh, but I soon became frustrated because I didn't know what was the meaning of these strange images. So I could guess some of its content, 
But some of it uh, really remained uh, absolutely unclear, which uh, made it difficult for me to read the cards. So uh, I started investigating the cards themselves. And I had the idea uh, to compare uh, the, the costumes, um, the, the way the, the, the characters are dressed in the figures of the, of the game, uh, to uh, the art, artworks of uh, history. Uh, because one thing that changes all the time and everywhere is fashion. You are not, we are not dressed as people were dressed 10 years ago or 20 years ago, and, and of course, uh, as uh, 500 years ago. And uh, so with this uh, method, I managed to uh, locate and to date the tarot of Marseille's deck, because it was the one I was interested in, this tarot of Marseille. And this led me to Italy, and especially the middle part of Italy, northern middle uh, part of Italy, in the Renaissance time, uh, that is at the end of the uh, 15th century. Yeah. So uh, I was uh, pretty happy with that. But then, uh, progressing in that research, I uh, managed to locate more precisely the design of the card, comparing it, the, its designs to engravings. And uh, so I became convinced that this very uh, Tarot of Marseille had been created in Florence in the years uh, around 1470. That's fascinating. And actually, you're seeing a lot more of the historians come around to the idea of Florence as being like yeah. very influential for tarot because, you know, it used to be it was mostly Milan and, you know, Milan a lot of Ferrara. Right. Mostly. Yeah. And when I started, of course, my conceptions were pretty heretic. Yeah. Because it was not the dominant uh, view at that time. And uh, at the same time, really, for reasons I could not explain, I was reading Plato's works. I, I had read the, the, uh, the symposium and really I, I was fascinated. And so I read uh, Plato's complete works starting from the beginning, beginning and uh, until the end. And suddenly I became amazed because I realized that uh, Plato's images which we know a little from school, and uh, but then uh, they exist uh, in the dialogues, like uh, Plato's Cavern, or the Chariot of the Soul, or the Idea of the Sun, etc. All, all these images, the Chimera uh, as an image of the, the multifarious uh, soul, all these images were strangely similar to the Tarot of Marsilio's Arcana. And so I thought to myself, how does this make sense? Uh, why uh, should Plato and uh, Italy in the 15th century be somehow related? Either the, the Arcana uh, correspond to a Platonic type or uh, they were made in, in, in Florence, but really this didn't make sense. And then I got aware of this man, Marsilio Ficino, uh, who was born in 1433 uh, and died in 1499, and who was the, the first translator of Plato's complete work from Greek to Latin in Florence. And there I had my match because there was a reason for these Platonic images to reappear in Florence precisely around 1417. The wow. dialogue of Marsilio Ficino in, that, in the Ficino's translation were published only in 1484, but they were already available to the scholars and to the literate people of Florence 
as early as uh, the end of the 1460s, beginning of the 70s. Yeah. You know what's interesting? Have you Are you familiar with Robert M. Place as well? Yes, yes. I've, okay. I've, I've read his book uh, about uh, Platonic. Uh, yeah, he's been saying the same thing for 25 years, too, about the pl the Neoplatonists. Yeah. So yeah. It, there must be something to that. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's very clear when you're looking at the Trumps that there's some sort of hierarchy and you can, you can sort of break them into three groups of seven and there's some story being told there. And whether, I'm sorry for the, for the uh, police they're going by, but <laughs> I am in Philadelphia after all um but yeah you can see like there is this obvious kind of uh story there yeah, and yeah. you're not the only person who came to that conclusion so it's it's yeah, that's, great. that's great there must be some something to that you know there is there is because then i started uh interesting me in these uh the, the, the specific works of this Ficino guy uh, because not only had he translated Plato's work, he also had commented them. And uh, this makes a, a very um, consistent corpus of, of works. But he also translated, and this is very interesting, he translated the Corpus Hermet Hermeticum. He was the first one to translate the Corpus Hermeticum. And he also translated many of the Platonists like Proclus, Plotinus, and of course, uh, he also was interested in Dante, uh, the vernacular poets of Florence. And this explains why the symbolism of these cards are uh, so uh, heavily laden with images from the antiquity images from uh, the vernacular poetry, the Florentine vernacular poetry, and also hermetic concepts. Yeah. So my uh, contention is that uh, Marsilio Ficino at that time had translated Plato's complete work, had translated the Corpus Hermeticum, had translated, uh, was uh, translating Plotinus, etc. And uh, he imagined uh, to create a game uh, in order to transmit this idea, like a pedagogic game. And this is what we have today in our hands. Uh, the tarot existed as early as the very beginning of the 15th century, when Ficino was... Uh, not born yet. Uh, yes, he, that's he, why I was, he, I was questioning. I was, okay, go ahead, continue. He, 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 he'll, he'll, uh, his birth date is on, in 1433, so the, the tarot ex already existed. But he used the tarot I see. as the structure. I and see. He transformed it according to yes. all these ideas that he had discovered in his translations. Yes. And he that's imagined. very plausible. That's very, very plausible, and it makes a lot of sense. I wasn't. I was going to ask you: Are you saying that he invented the tarot, or invented this variation of the sea order, which which seems to be what you're what you're suggesting? The tarot existed already. Yeah. He kept the structure unchanged: seventy-eight cards, twenty-two trumps, uh, 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 spades, uh, co uh, coins. Uh, cups, uh, all this existed already. But he had the idea to transform the design of the trump cards, also slightly of uh, the, the, the pip cards, but mainly of the trump card, in order to convey his philosophy, uh, his knowledge, his theology, his ideas about uh, Plato, Hermes, magic. He was, he was not only a scholar. He was also a priest. Yeah. So this explains why some religious ideas appear in the Torah. He was an astrologist and he practiced astrology, which explains also why astrology appears uh, in, in the Torah. And finally, he was a magician and he claims himself to be a magician. 
So this is a, a really fascinating character. And uh, obviously, uh, he, according to me, he was the, um, the brain behind the making of the Tarot of Marseille. But he couldn't have done it alone because Ficino was not uh, an artist. He couldn't draw, uh, he couldn't uh, engrave. Uh, so uh, during my research, I identified various hands of artists in uh, comparing the tarot trumps with artworks of the Florentine uh, Renaissance, I identified various hands, amongst which, and this will sound extraordinary, but uh, I have uh, many examples to ascertain this, amongst which the hand of Sandro Botticelli. Yes. Sandro Botticelli was contemporarian to Ficino. Uh, and, and Florence at that time was a, a very small town. Um, Ficino's patron was Lorenzo de Medici, Lorenzo il Magnifico. And Lorenzo il Magnifico was also the patron of Botticelli. So we have a team there of people. We have the scientist, the philosopher, who had uh, the intellectual means to conceive these very specific ideas full of symbolism. There was the artistic hands, that of Sandro Botticelli, but also of engravers, of other characters uh, which are uh, lesser known. Um, I think of a guy named Felice Feliciano, who was uh, a, print, a printer, uh, he was a, a type designer, he was a, a, a drawer, he was a miniaturist, and so he was a, a man of, of all jobs around printing and, uh, and uh, printmaking. And so uh, various of his designs uh, appear to be models for different tarot cards. Uh, for example, uh, one uh, of the, the most famous is um, The Lovers. The Lovers is directly inspired from a drawing by Felice Feliciano, which represents the choice of Hercules. Yes, thank you very much. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I would like to show you the, um, the, the drawing by Felice Feliciano, but I would have to, to go behind me and, and get the book it's a little complicated but <laughs> i can't yeah, hear oh, no okay. i i was talking to somebody else i was just telling oh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, that's... Um, a teamwork a teamwork in the 1470s involving um, a philosopher artist and uh, uh, probably a financer which i guess could have been uh, Lorenzo de' Medici himself, or other um, um, wealthy people of uh, uh, Fici, of uh, people of Florence who were friends of Ficino, he he knew um, all the establishment. Ficino was the most important servant of his time. Uh, he corresponded with uh, France. He corresponded with Hungary, with Germany. Uh, uh, and um, uh, he, he was really the most brilliant uh, philosopher and philosophy was the most important science of that time. So that's... Uh, yeah, it's that's very interesting. interesting. I mean, I have a lot of questions in my mind yeah. about how uh, the tarot would get to Marseille. Also, there's, I mean, there's a lot of interesting things yeah. to think uh, about. Marseille. That's, that's uh, uh, an old problem for tar um, tarologists or people interested in, in tarot and especially in the Tarot of Marseille. It's that name. Because... Yeah, well, not... I, I didn't mean... I'm sorry. I didn't mean exactly the city of Marseille, but I meant 
like Leon, Rouen, all France. Yeah. You know, how, how did it get from so Florence? One important, point, one important point is the name. Yes. Because this tarot is named Tarot de Marseille or Tarot of Marseille. Yet, uh, it was not specifically made in Marseille. It was indeed made in Marseille. Yes. There, there were many printmakers in Marseille. But as you say, there were also printmakers in Lyon, in Besançon, in Dijon, and uh, yes. all around France. So why would that specific tarot design uh, be called Tarot of Marseille? And my theory is uh, that uh, it was not the Tarot of Marseille at first. It came from Italy. And when it came from Italy, it might have been called by the name of its author, and the name of its author would have been, according to my theory, Marsilio Ficino. Marsilio sounds exactly like Marseille. So when we when 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 it was presented as oh this is le tarot de Marsilio, people would hear oh this is the tarot de, de Marsilia. It sounds in French, almost identically. It's just one vowel difference. And that's that's how, be, because French people wouldn't know this Ficino guy who was Italian, and and the, the, the game reappeared many years after uh, its creation time when it reappeared in France. So they just thought, oh, it's not the Tarot of Marsilio, it's the Tarot of Marsilia. And that's how it got this name. I was looking at the title of your future book, which is, you know, we'll, we'll get to, you can talk that, about that. Yes, but yes, I was yes, like, yes. Um, I was like, well, I, you know, that's a clever title for, for what you're, for what you're arguing. But I, I didn't actually know that, that you were going to make the point, which that you just made, which is that the name came from that, which is, uh, I mean, that would be a fascinating story. It really would be in the artists that are involved. I always had the kind of gut feeling, and this is like a very uneducated kind of guess, but like a gut feeling. I just have a gut feeling that tarot came out of Florence and particularly like the Renaissance. I just, I oh, just, great. yeah, I just always felt that, you know? Yeah. Um, but I don't have like any, any kind of, you know, academic clout Evidence. behind that. Yeah, exactly. It just kind of was a gut feeling, you know? Um, my question would be about the the carry sheet. Are you familiar with the carry sheet? Yes. Uh, um, according to me, uh, it, it's usually presented as the oldest. Uh, according to me, yeah. So this is the carry sheet here. Hmm. And there, there are many similarities. Uh, with the, the Marseille design. Uh, but according to me, it's not earlier than the Tarot of Marseille. Okay. It's rather a later derivation, a later adaptation of the Marseille uh, deck. Why do I think this? Um, it is because when I compare the uh, tarot of Marseille design, especially in the Convert version, which, which for me is the most faithful to the original design. Um, this uh, Convert design really compares incredibly well with uh, engravings uh, made in Florence exactly around 1470 to 1475. Wow. And um, the carry sheet designs do not look as an intermediary between uh, the, the engravings, which I just mentioned by Baccio Baldini. It's a series on the prophet. Essentially, it's a series about the prophets and Sibyls. Uh, and uh, there are 36 prophets and Sibyls, uh, 24 prophets and 12 Sibyls, and uh, uh, they were made in France in 1470, and really some details are exactly 
inspiring the Tarot of Marseille, um, especially uh, the Emperor, the Empress, the Pope, the Popes, and Justice. And it's really a very striking. Uh, so, well, if, I was just going to say, I imagine that you will be covering this in your book, you know, and, yeah, sure, the, and sure. that's what I'm going to wait for to see because this, the, it sounds fascinating, you know, yeah. and like what a story it would be. I mean, it would mm. be like the, the, the best story of tarot ever. I, I already published uh, these ideas, but I did it in academic uh, papers, in uh, scientific uh, journals. And so the, the, the echo, echo is, uh, is very uh, slight. And uh, um, it's strange to see that uh, scholars uh, are reluctant to study the tarot. It's like uh, it uh, smells like sulfur, you know, yeah. and uh, there's some uh, danger for a, a scholar to get involved in investig an, an investigation uh, on the tarot. Uh, there has been uh, in the 80s a controversy between Michael Dummett and a famous uh, English scholar, which was called Francis Yates. And uh, Dummett published um, a very big book, uh, authoritative, on the tarot, uh, called uh, The Game of Tarot. Uh, the Game of Tarot. Yeah, published in 1980. 1980. And Michael Domet in this book in this book writes that for him uh, there is absolutely no esotericism in the images of the Tarot of Marseille. It's just normal images of that time. Okay, you see an emperor. Well, it's an emperor. The, the people had emperors at that time, so you see an emperor as, uh, as an illustration of the idea of uh, emperor and uh, the same for uh, the artisan who, who, who becomes uh, uh, the battler and uh, etc all, all these are just uh, plain ideas of that time and francis yates um, uh, wrote uh, um, um, a review of uh, Dummett's uh, book uh, in the new york review uh, of books yeah. and she said that she was surprised she was uh, criticizing this view because according to him to her and she was a, a leading um, scholar of the renaissance according to 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 her these image had to have some esotericism in them because that's how People proceeded at that time, and because for her, uh, they were like uh, hieroglyphs, but not in the sense of Champollion, in the sense of the Renaissance, when hieroglyphs still kept all their mysteries and were like uh, images embedding knowledge and secretly embedding knowledge. So uh, there are like uh, games, like puzzles to solve. And uh, the, the, the one who studies these, um, these uh, arcana have to dig into them to find their hidden meaning. But it's not the obvious meaning. It's like a multi-layered uh, image. Uh, there's the, the, the first layer, quite obvious, and uh, you see this, and ah, this, it's horrible, and uh, something uh, horrible is going to happen to me. But then, if you look into it, uh, you see that the, uh, the, there's a structure inside the, the, the skeleton, and this structure illustrates the idea of life. And so it's not so much the triumph of death 
as the triumph of life. And life is a cycle and which always needs um, a moment of uh, uh, resetting everything. And this is the idea of this card, which has no name. Uh, it's not death when you in the Tarot of Marseille. Yeah. So, um, unfortunately, uh, Francis Yates die, died uh, shortly after the beginning of the controversy, and this ended the controversy. And today, the leading theory about uh, the hidden meaning in the Tarot of Marseille card is that there is no absolutely no hidden meaning, yeah. no mystery, and no nothing. They are just cards to play cards. And all my the, the, the sense of my research is to show that, on the contrary, uh, there were tarots made for playing at the beginning, but then this Marsilio Ficino had the idea to use it for something else. I think it could. Well, I was just going to say, I think it could be both. It could be both, um, you know, it could be both just a game and something very meaningful. Do you know what I mean? So, I mean, it doesn't have to be one or the other. But Michael Dummett is definitely like very known for his um, anti um, hermetic and occult type leanings in his book. You know, I mean, I've, I've heard that many times. In fact, like when I first discovered Michael Dummett, I almost signed, sort of started to ad adopt that approach a little bit, and I've oh, I've yes. I've recently come away from that. But I, I took because everybody in the community, at least in the his tarot history sphere, holds him in such high esteem. Um, and to a new a newbie to tarot history, you know, you don't know enough to kind of have an opinion one way or the other. So you're just kind of absorbing everything. So I took it almost like gospel, you know, and. And uh, yeah. but his books were also very helpful to me too, you know. Um, Absolutely. Particularly for like, too. yeah, yeah, exactly. I, but I, very useful in the sense that uh, for the first time with Michael Domet, uh, there was a scientific approach to this image, and uh, he was not a scholar uh, of the Renaissance or of philosophy, which explains why he didn't go yeah. into this kind of research, but uh, he, um, with uh, Sylvia Mann, who co-signed the, the, the book with him, um, they, they investigated, uh, investigated the tarot uh, very scientifically, which provided the basis for all the research that followed, uh, including mine. Yeah. Even if I, I, I totally disagree with these Peculiar, particular sure. conclusions. Definitely, the rest. Well, I mean, there's so much dated about that. But I mean, even like with the carry sheet, for instance, he, he says that's from Milan. I don't think most people today probably would say it's not from. Yeah. I mean, you know, they would say it's either from Florence or I think it's possibly even French. I don't know. I, I, I and again, this is a gut feeling, but I, I, I feel like it could be like Leon or. Uh, like Avignon or somewhere like that, you know. I mean, this is we just don't know. And like you said, I mean, the date is you know it's dated to fifteen hundred, but we don't know that for sure. I mean, mm. so you know, there is in a tendency uh, in the narrow-minded um, areas of tarot research uh, to date uh, the decks according to their publication date. Let's say. You, you find a card and you find written on the two of, of cups uh, uh, 1758 uh, and then you say oh uh, then this deck must be dated from uh, 1758 no uh, this is not like this there's a tradition and uh, uh, the, the the material facts help us in dating the cards but this is not sufficient. Uh, the cards disappear once you've played uh, uh, with the game uh, a long time. It, it's just worn out and you put it to the rubbish. And so yes. we do not have uh, the, the cards of the origins. They are all lost. And, and we have, fortunately, we have 
one carry sheet. We have uh, the cards found in a, in a well, which correspond to the uh, Marseille um, design uh, in Milan, and which we can be dated around 1570, uh, 1568, hmm, precisely, I think. And so we know the cards are earlier than uh, the time they appeared physically. Yeah, yeah. That, I mean, that's for sure. You know, and it's 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 tricky and elusive. I mean, there's there's no way to know. And I I really do. I can't wait to read your book. I'm very very excited. It's it's really an exciting theory. I mean, yes, because you know, I do not agree with the idea that there's no way to to find out. No, uh, just you know, we have not kept any manuscript of Plato's complete works. Uh, no manuscript of early uh, uh, early manuscripts of uh, of Plato's works. Uh, we still think that Plato did write his dialogues in the fifth, uh, fourth century before Christ. We don't need to have a sheet of paper with uh, the manuscript uh, text written on it to say, oh, this is from the fourth, fourth century before Christ. We know because we can investigate in different ways. We have testimonies. And uh, with the, the images we have, uh, like when we study the history of costumes or the, the, the history of art, we can date an image from a later copy. And that's what I'm, I'm trying to do in my, in my book. That's uh, through these comparisons that I can uh, show uh, how an image necessarily um, is inspired by another one and uh, that it has to have occurred early in time because these images then were kept in uh, bibliotheques or libraries or uh, and, and were not public. Like, uh, you know, when you have a drawing uh, that, that is in a sketchbook that was kept by the hairs of a painter, and then you see it reappear on a tarot card, and obviously it's directly inspired from it. How could it have sprung uh, 50, 700 years later from the sketchbook? to the tarot card. This is not the way it happened. It happened in the time the sketchbook was still uh, operating, when its uh, owner was still using it to um, produce new artworks. All, all the artists had a workshop and to make um, um, as a tool for the workshop, there were these sketchbooks and they were used. And they, that's the way the designs were transmitted uh, from a fresco to, uh, I don't know, a flag. Uh, Botticelli made flags, he, he made coats, he made uh, uh, like um, uh, many different things that were used every day in every day. Life. Every day, the he was a life. Renaissance man, you know, literally a Renaissance man. You know, the yeah. saying Renaissance man, he was literally a, re a Renaissance man. So, <laughs> yeah. That's that's very cool. Uh, also, by the way, thank you everybody for joining. And I'm sorry I, I haven't uh, really been able to say hello individually. I'll just do that now. Hello, Richard, uh, Entropy Apothecary. Hello, Lori. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Elemental Cardamancy, my friend Chris, Emmy. Uh, Alejandro, hello, welcome, thank you very much, and Early Ritual, thank you for joining. And by the way, um, so Christoph has a documentary which I've linked below, Les Mysteries du Tarot de Marseille, is that how, how yes, however you would... Version. It's a, and uh, the English version as well. the English version. Yes, yes. yeah, you I can watch it. I think it's to the English version. Yes, I've linked it to the English, but you can also find without 
much difficulty. You could find the, um, the French version as well. And then Christoph also has like many um, papers and things uh, which you can find. I, I provided a link for academia.edu mm -hmm. has some of his papers. There may be better resources, but that that's the one I came across. Um, and are you on, uh, now you're on Facebook. Are you on Instagram? This light is killing me. I'm so sorry. It's like the sun no. is shining directly in my face oh. uh, today. It's kind of like I'm, I'm playing dodgeball here with the, with the sun. Um, are you on Instagram or? Um, I'm not on Instagram, but I have a Facebook page named Villa Standal. Okay, Villa Stand. Okay, very good. Because I'm friends well, with you on Facebook, but I don't know about that one. So I'll link that below as well. Yeah. Um, I'll find Thank that you. and, and mm -hmm. link it as well. And uh, there I, I published uh, updates on my research now nice. and then according to the progresses I, uh, I make. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah, another interesting thing I was thinking about with your theory is the 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 tarot orders. It would be something to explore, you know, like because Florence is known for order A, you know, so it's like, you know, those types of things, which I'm not very qualified to really talk about. But, um, you know, it would be interested to to explore that, you know, like why, for instance, they didn't go with order A and they changed it and why uh, order C, this variation of order C is not really known um, well in Italy. Yeah, well, this was very well explained by uh, by Demet, and th th this um, this is central to his the game of tarot, where he explained how different regions had different orders, because obviously the, the players from Ferrara were used to a certain order, while the, those of Milan had uh, another order of the trance. Um, Regarding the Charlotte of Marseille, and so this very special design, uh, the order is uh, widely known is the, the, the to nowadays the, the, the most classical, I would say, whereas the, the, all, the others have uh, disappeared. Uh, what is interesting in that structure, uh, that of the, the Tower of Marseille, is um, that uh, in fact the underlying uh, structure of this game is hidden and it's not uh, the one two three four five uh, until uh, 21 order uh, behind me i have this uh, bibliotheque and it's structured in three uh, layers and each uh, layer uh, has uh, seven uh, columns, I would say. Um, in a text of Marsilio Ficino, he speaks about a triple septenary. So it means um, a triple seven. And then he has this very strange text where he talks about the planets and you don't really make sense out of it unless you take the deck of the Tarot of Marsilio and especially the 22 trump cards and then you can, according to this text, it's like cryptic uh, talking, double meanings, puzzles, uh, but then uh, using uh, this text as a guide, you can put the all the cards in this three times seven uh, maze or structure. And uh, at the bottom, the lower layer, you have uh, the terrestrial level, which is the lower level. Uh, this is the world which we occup occupy. And in this layer, uh, you have uh, like uh, um, um, the cards that are that have the, the, the most practical meaning, like you have the, the chariot, you have the devil, you have uh, um, excuse me, yes, the lovers, strength, 
you have the hermit, you have, uh, uh, and so on. And each column is dedicated to a planet. There were seven planets according to the astrology of this time, and each column is uh, dedicated to a planet. For example, you have the column of Venus with the lovers at the bottom, which is uh, obviously um, Venus stars in its um, lowest uh, expression, uh, that of carnal love between uh, two persons. In the middle, you have the star, and this is uh, the Venus stars of the lower Venus, which in the mind of Ficino, following Plotinus and following Plato, which is nature, nature in that uh, um, there is a power that irrigates the world. This power is Venusian, is under the influence of Venus, and it makes things grow, and it makes things uh, come to life, and it, it creates birth. This is uh, how uh, Venus operates in this intermediate range through uh, the star. And then on the higher level, you have uh, la papesse, the popus, and the popus, very mysterious card, because in the Renaissance time, can you imagine a popus? Uh, this popus, in fact, is uh, not a popus. It's a disguise under which we find Minerva, Athena, the goddess of intelligence. And uh, nature is the daughter of this intelligence. You have two Venuses. The upper Venus is uh, Athena, born from Jupiter's, uh, from Jupiter directly without conception. Um, and then under her, you have uh, the naked star, uh, which is nature, that is intelligence uh, uh, inserted into the world. And finally, uh, love as we know it, so Venus as we are acquainted as ter uh, humans to it, uh, that is uh, sexual intercourse, uh, uh, sentimentality, etc. And, and the idea of a choice, because um, uh, in this lower uh, card of Venus, which is represented uh, by the, the lovers, there are not two. It's not a couple under uh, Cupid. There are three persons. And there's the, the boy. And the boy is in between two women. And these two women are, in fact, the two Venuses. Uh, the lower Venus is the one with a strange hat. And she touches the man. She hugs him. She, like, because she's trying to seduce him, she is directing her eyes directly into the man's eyes. And we know that in the Renaissance uh, conception, um, looking someone directly into the eyes was a way of uh, um, peering their soul, attracting love. There was okay. like rays. Oh, there were like rays that really came out of the lover's eyes to the beloved ones, and this contact, this eye contact, would absolutely create the, the loving relationship between them. So we have this... It's like the yes, show great. The show so, yeah, sure. So she's holding her shoulder and she's patting his hip with the other hand. Whereas the other, uh, the other woman, uh, she's sad and she's putting her hand on his heart because she's appealing to his heart. Uh, she has flowers. If you look 
carefully, you will see that she has flowers in her hair. It's hidden because obviously the author wants uh, the, the game to be a little interesting. So you must not find out things directly. You have to investigate. And uh, so she has flowers in her head. And in the Renaissance time, the woman who had this crown of flowers was the bride in, um, in a marriage. And so the young man and this woman are married. But this corresponds to the idea that we are all married to wisdom. And we are seduced by the appeal of the flesh, by the appeal of um, carnal beauty. And so uh, there's a choice there to be made between uh, the, the one or the other. And Cupid is there above the, the man, man's head. And it, it, it's a, an image of what he's thinking. What is he thinking? He's thinking, oh, I might be seduced by this lovely looking woman. But if I do so, this arrow, which Cupid is holding, might fall on the link which I have with this, my wife and wisdom. And so I will become a fool. So in this card, we have the idea of the choice between the two Venuses, the higher one, which represents intelligence, wisdom, and the lower one, which represents nature, the appeal of nature. There is not a bad one and a good one in Ficino's conception, but there are two different degrees in the way we can um, accomplish ourselves. First, we have to accomplish ourselves by giving life. And then we can accomplish ourselves, like Plato says, says um, in, uh, in his dialogues, uh, in uh, the symposium, in Diotim's uh, dialogue, uh, we can accomplish ourselves in the works of the spirits. And uh, that's the higher level, but we need both to accomplish ourselves. And uh, so every column of uh, the, this structure is dedicated to planet. And uh, the, the one dedicated to Jupiter has three cards, like all other, like for all other planets, but we have this triple septenary, this triple seven, because the lower one is the chariot, the chariot, so number seven uh, in the tarot of uh, Marsilio. Uh, then the intermediary one is a temperance, two times seven, 14. And the right. upper one is the world, three times seven, 21. Okay, I'm, I'm looking for that. So you got the world, um, temperance, and the chariot. And the chariot. And of course, this is where having the book will um, come in handy, but it's something like this, right? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. So that's how we would see it, you know. Yeah. That's really, really cool. Oh, the sun is getting on my nerves today. But yeah, it's fascinating. I mean, I can't wait to have a copy of the book in three volumes. So Three volumes, yes. Uh, it will take time. But I'm very fortunate that uh, uh, the publishing company uh, Scarlet Imprint was interested by the, the manuscript because I, I don't know if you know them. Uh, I've heard they, of them before, uh, Scarlet Imprint. They are, they are dedicated to public, they are in, an independent company and they are dedicated to publishing uh, books uh, about uh, uh, the occult. Uh, magic, um, uh, witchcraft, uh, tarot, yeah. obviously, cool. and uh, they are making books that are like talismans. It's really nicely made, beautiful paper, right. uh, beautiful reproduction, and uh, it's absolutely fantastic. Wonderful. And they published a few years ago uh, already a book on 
Another tarot deck, which you might know, it's uh, the Solabuska tarot. Uh, yeah, and was it, that the game of Saturn? Did they, they were they? Mm-hmm. Was that the game of Saturn? Are they absolutely the the okay? That was the game of Saturn. Yeah, I have that book. Okay, by uh, Peter that... Mark Adams, okay. and Peter Mark Adams made a, a wonderful work in uh, identifying the ideas that uh, inspire this image, which are totally different from the Tarot of Mar- of Marseille's uh, ones, but it also reflect another philosophy. The philosophy of the Tarot of Marseille is the philosophy of Marsilio Ficino. It's a philosophy of love. Uh, it's a philosophy of ide- ideas and uh, of um, um, ideal. I mean, uh, it's platonic. It's in blue with platonism. Mm-hmm. On the contrary, uh, the um, the Tarot Solabuska uh, is dedicated to a philosophy of power. It was made in other, another court of the Renaissance. Uh, the Tarot of Martillo is from Florence. The Tarot Solabuska is probably from Ferrara or from Venice. So it was uh, produced in a totally different context where the people who had the power behaved completely differently. And I think they probably were ruthless warriors, uh, man of world, and uh, their philosophy was rather that of uh, strength, of power, of uh, domination, rather than the philosophy that uh, was dominant in Florence of that, at that time, this philosophy of, of love that uh, Ficino uh, was trying to develop and to, um, uh, to transmit. And the game of tarot, the tarot, the tarot of Marsilio, was his instrument. Why didn't he say, why didn't he write in his books I invented an instrument to explain my philosophy. That's a very important question because yeah. that would seem normal. The problem is, for him at that time, is, and it's a real problem for him, is that the philosophy of Plato is not accepted by the church. So it's a fight for him to have it accepted in the circles uh, of of the church. And the church is very uh, powerful. Uh, At the end of his life, around 1489, so we are nearing the end of his life, it's about 10 years before he dies, he published a a book uh, entitled De Triplici Vita, of the tribal uh, life and uh, in this book he talked about talismans he talked about astrology he talked about magic and uh, the church was very worried about it and uh, he almost went to the stake fortunately for him he was protected by the medici which avoided him the terrible consequences but others in the same period were burnt at the stake yes so one had to be very prudent uh, so that's why he made his game which are full not only of philosophical and uh, uh, concepts but also of religious idea not only christian but also pagan i explained this already under the disguise of the popus hides Minerva, uh, hides um, Athena, and it's the same for for many other uh, figures in the game. Of particular interest are uh, the figures that very few people understand usually, 
because they are very abstract. And usually people think that, you know, that those cards of which we say, oh, these are images of the, the figures of that time, uh, Empress, Emperor, Popus, Pope, uh, Justice, you know, it's just abstract uh, things and they don't mean much. Uh, on the contrary, uh, they correspond to a myth that appears in Book 10 of the Republic of Plato, uh, and it is the myth of Ur. Ur was a warrior who died at war and was uh, about to be burnt ritually uh, as a dead body. But then uh, he uh, woke up from the stake and he told what he had seen in uh, the world of death. And so he tells about uh, his meeting with uh, um, the, the, the higher uh, gods of the, the other world, the upper world, and uh, the leading figure of this world is Ananke. Ananke is the divine justice. And Ananke has three daughters. Uh, three daughters are the Paka, the Pakae. The, the fates, we, we would say in English, the fates. And they, they, they have each uh, one has a name, Lachesis, Cloto, Atropos. Um, and then these parque, these fates, uh, do attribute their fates to the souls in the myth of Plato. And um, Lachesis is more concerned about the beginning, uh, Cloto of the present, and Atropos of the future. And we have also another character which is in relation with uh, Lachesis, and he is the prophet who attributes physically uh, each to each soul his destiny. And all these characters are, in fact, figures in the Tarot of Marseille. The prophet who attributes his destiny to each soul is, of course, uh, the Pope. Uh, the three Parker are uh, the Popes, Lachesis, uh, the Empress, Atropos, uh, sorry, uh, Cloto, and the emperor, Atropos. And finally, justice is the mother of all these, um, these figures. And she is the, the ruler of the world. She is the, the providence also in Ficino's conception of uh, this uh, Platonic myth. So in the upper part of this bibliotheque, and of the structure of the game, you have these figures, which means that in Ficino's conception, uh, divinity is multiple. And it's not, as in Christianity, a simple trinity. It's a multiplicity of gods. And in this way, uh, Ficino can be considered a heretic in the Catholic conception. So he could not possibly have showed this game because he would absolutely have ended up on the stake. Yeah. This is really very interesting, and I thank you so much. You're doing such an amazing job explaining this uh, in this format, and um, I encourage people to check out the documentary uh, also. I mean, this is really so I, I to be studied. I did the documentary uh, five years ago. My research continued all, all of that time. I already had the global uh, schema 
of um, of all that I'm explaining and of all that I'm going to to put in this three volume uh, book. Uh, but when I made the documentary, I could only focus on a few cards. So. Uh, yeah, well, for time's might be sake. disappointing because I'm, I will talk about uh, the devil. I will talk about the chariot. I will talk about, um, uh, but uh, uh, the temperance. Uh, yes, there is a in the film uh, a passage which uh, will uh, be probably remarked by uh, those who will see it because I'm going at some point. Uh, in Hungary, in Estergom, in a, in a castle. And in this castle, uh, f frescoes were found in the beginning of the 20th century. And this, uh, this fresco represents the virtues, uh, temperance, justice, prudence, and uh, strength. Uh, recently, at the beginning of the year two th 2000, uh, the restorer, the Hungary um, uh, restorer of this fresco, uh, Susanna Wierdl, uh, realized while doing her work that these frescoes were from a, a, a master's hand. Not, it was not just the ordinary fresco of the Renaissance. This was really the work of a master. And then, um, Continuing her research, she, she realized that it was the hand of Botticelli. And so she, she announced this. And when she announced this, it was published all around the world. And I, I could get my eyes on these frescoes. And I recognized immediately the temperance of the Towers of Marseille. So I went to Estergom and I filmed uh, Susanna in, in the basement of this, uh, this, this castle. And uh, you can see how surprised she is to discover that uh, uh, tarot cards uh, were similar to um, these, uh, these frescoes that she attributed to Botticelli. Unfortunately, uh, Botticelli scholar, scholars do not accept uh, Susanna's attribution. Uh, I am personally absolutely convinced that she is right. But, you know, sometimes it takes time to... Uh, for the mentalities to evolve and to, yeah. to take, take into account new ideas. Uh, but um, anyway, um, it's, it really gives a, a credit to the idea that really these cards were made in, in the Renaissance because uh, for uh, um, uh, 300 years, until they were rediscovered, uh, these frescoes were deep under the ground into uh, gravel and you couldn't see them because it was all destroyed. The, um, the castle had been destroyed during the, the Ottoman period. And so obviously, if this temperance and also justice look like their equivalent in the Tower of Marseille cards, it is because uh, they were copied in the Renaissance times. Fascinating. You have a lot of really Nice comments here. I just wanted to make sure that you knew. Um, you can see the comments up on top right. of the right if you click. If you click on comments uh, with your mouse, oh, yeah, you'll be yeah, able to, yeah. you'll yeah, be able yeah. to see it's what open. people are saying. I should have told you that in the beginning, but just a lot of nice things. Um, everybody is just saying so many nice things here. Ah. Thanks, everybody, for stopping by. Um, yeah, so definitely. you're a card reader, right? You also read yeah. the tarot. Yeah. In fact, uh, as a matter of fact, that's that's how I started. Uh, as, as I said, I I was reading the cards, and it's I, I got into the, that research to better understand the meaning of the cards. I, I really wanted to explore this meaning uh because this I, I i was absolutely sure that this was the only way for me to make a correct card reading uh, as i told you the cards are multi-layered and if you get only the more obvious layer then you miss uh, all the other layers 
which are so important when making a reading. Um, making a, a card, a tarot reading, is establishing connections uh, between the different figures. Uh, you, you do not just read each card after the other, you interconnect them. But to interconnect them properly, you have to have all these layers and so that you can associate one layer of one figure to the other figure's layer. And you have to, uh, to master all that knowledge. Like, for example, all the, the arcana do not have the same value. Uh, if you under, once you understand that there is this structure and that the lower cards uh, talk to us about the terrestrial world, whereas the higher cards told, tell, tell us about the higher yes. world, then it makes uh, a difference. For sure. And uh, you have to contrast these things when you, you make a, the, the reading. I am not a professional reader myself. Uh, it's a choice. I, I do not want. I, it takes me too much time to to study the card uh, to exert professionally, and also I think it's a job in itself, and uh, that's that's not my part. But I enjoy doing it for friends and for just uh, for the fun of of reading, and. Uh, uh, Knowing all that uh, I have discovered through time uh, makes the reading totally different. You, you, you just do not see the same things. You have a much deeper knowledge, uh, understanding of the relationships between, uh, between the, the card and you, you associate them with much uh, better efficiency. Um, that's why I think that my books might interest tarot readers. Yeah. Uh, they give you insight on what, what's inside, what's under the surface of the images. Are you going to dedicate a chapter or a section of the book to card reading by any chance? Or is it just going to be strictly iconography? Like, will, will that fit in with your book? Just curious. Uh, this book is not only about iconography, there's also much philosophy, uh, history, uh, but not card reading. Oh. Uh, I will write another book for practitioners yeah. because I think this can be very useful, like a, like a manual, you know, yeah. uh, uh, like a method, because there is also the methodological point of view. Once you you are uh, aware of this structure, the method definitely ch changes. And, yeah. and you take into account things that you do not have to take into account if you just remain on. The, not to say that uh, uh, card readers uh, are not uh, aware of, of this, but you, you have a better consciousness of, of this. And uh, I think it helps. Great. So when is the book coming out? Do you have an idea? Do you have a rough yeah, estimate? Yeah, yeah. Um, it will, uh, the first volume will come out in uh, next summer. Next summer, okay. So it's going to uh, soon to be there. We have much work still. Good. Uh, the, the text is, uh, is okay and accepted and all the images. Uh, but now, the, now comes the, the, the time of designing uh, the talisman. Because as, as I said, Scarlet Imprint uh, publishes talismans. And so it's, yeah. it, it, it's, it's really an important part of the work is to make it like uh, a magical object that oh. has an embedded power in it. So you, you have to take care of every detail. Uh, every, every aspect has to be taken care of. So this will take some, quite some time. Uh, then we will publish, um, after the, the first one, we'll take time to, to do the, the second volume. The text is also completely uh, finished. 
and um, and uh, we also have only this uh, uh, ultimate part of the job to do. Uh, but the, the third uh, volume um, is still in the course of, uh, of writing. Uh, it's about uh, halfway. I know what I'm going to put in inside it. Uh, to tell you why we have uh, three volumes, and I think it's uh, also an important point, um, the first volume is mainly dedicated to the inquiry. How I proceeded to arrive at that point. And in the course of uh, explaining about this inquiry, especially uh, the iconographical point of view, I will tell about the seven lower cards of the structure, which I uh, mentioned. So the chariot, the devil, um, the um, uh, lovers, uh, etc. And then, um, and this will be all for the first volume. In the second volume, I will tell about all the other cards, uh, the celestial ones and the intermediate ones. And uh, this uh, second volume will have a more philosophical twist, but there will still be a lot of iconography and many uh, uh, images as, as references. And the third volume will talk about this structure and we, we will decipher the text which I talked to you about, um, this uh, text about uh, this astrological text about the structure in three sevens. And uh, it will be the, the more, let's say, one could say, religious, cosmological, uh, spiritual volume of the three. But through this explanation, we'll, we'll return to each of the arcana in a deeper way, because with the help of the structure, it will help us to get into the, the most intimate uh, meaning of the cards, of the arcana. Very cool. And that, so I'm, I'm starting to understand, this is sort of off topic, but I'm starting to understand why you chose the back design of your, your deck now. Because I was always like, I loved the back of his deck, but I'm like, I just didn't really understand what it, but it has such deep meaning. Could you just talk a little bit about that? Like your what? Yes, I, I, I'd love to talk about this, uh, this deck because this is a, a work that I didn't know, not uh, did not do alone by myself. Uh, I worked with my business partner at that uh, when we, when this deck was made. Uh, you know, the film was produced by the company which had founded with that uh, person. Her name is Marino El Jean, and she was the art director of this project, and she she led the team of uh, graphists who cleaned and who uh, really went deep into uh, the understanding of all the details of the card because we really wanted it to be 100% faithful to uh, the, the model we have chosen, the Convert model, uh, which we gathered different samples, the one from the Bibliothèque Nationale, but not only other uh, decks which we convert decks which survived until uh, now, and we really compared the different uh, copies we we could put our hands on uh, to really get the uh, very precise tarot that was needed for research. We really needed an instrument, a faithful instrument, and so this team of graphists, uh, three of them led by Marino El Jean did this 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 wonderful job and then uh, there was the question of the, the back of the decks and obviously knowing all that we know about the structure uh, marino el jean had this idea to to put it on the back of the cars and um, and so we have the seven planets uh, the yeah. most important of which are the sun symbolized by the, the the circle with the dot and the moon with the, uh, the crescent. 
So and then the seven moving bodies. Hmm. Very cool. So there, there is some astrology in the tarot. There is uh, some magic. Uh, one of the questions that I would like to leave suspended, an important one though, is the question of uh, the divinatory use at the time of Fichino. Okay. Because common uh, science says that the tarot was, were not used for divinatory uh, purposes before Etela. Etela, who used, who was the first to use uh, tarot cards for divination in the modern period. But what was the case in the Renaissance time? Well, that doesn't mean that people weren't telling stories with with the with the deck, and it wasn't it wasn't real. I mean, that we know of, there was no documented evidence of it written down. But there wouldn't be either, because as the you mentioned, you know, because of the church and so forth, uh, it would be very difficult for a person to write about cardamancy without getting burned at the stake. So you're not going to have that kind of written. But I mean, it's you know, kids when they pick up a deck of any playing cards they tell stories with them you know and so if children yeah. do that you know adults do that it's, it's a very natural thing so is divination i mean i can remember my early one of my earliest memories with divination is just a n normal 52 deck of you know american english playing cards i would do yes or no and i would do you know like odds would be yes even would be no or whatever you mm -hmm. know red black whatever and you would just ask a question and do it so it's a very natural thing you know divination so absolutely. people were absolutely using these cards for divination it just wasn't done in any any um official way absolutely. until like Itea, you absolutely. know what i mean uh, particularly you, yeah i mean that's my opinion anyway uh, i couldn't agree more uh obviously obviously this this was the, the way they, they were used in ficino's writings he sometimes seems to be alluding to it he, he talks about uh, the prophecies of uh, he, he talks about the oracles and we don't know what these oracles are. So, in my opinion, he he was referring to to this card. I, I would like to show you uh, one of my uh, decks from my collection. Oh, sure. Which, which is an, an illustration of um, of the 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 use of um, cards for divination. Okay. Yeah, somebody had written, my friend Chris had written, said, I think it would be absolutely fascinating to hear uh, Christoph do a tarot reading. Yeah. Or let me make Look. it, I'll make you bigger here. Oh, there we go. This, okay. This tarot deck, which I was fortunate to, to purchase a few years ago. And you see on this card, there are manuscript readings. Yes. You see, for example, here on this magician is written malady, which is French for disease. Okay, now we have the point. There it is. Okay. Well, okay, you get it. Uh, and there we have the purpose la femme pour qui. Uh, which which means uh, uh, the woman for for which uh, we we are reading the cards in a, in French. Okay. So the consultant, she's the consultant, and uh, uh, we have here. Sometimes, if you put your hand behind it, like they do this thing where if you do this kind of thing, like if you put. I don't um, know. It might focus okay. in. Yeah. Appui. Yeah. So it, it strength in, in a way. Hmm. Uh, this is a 18th century hand, and uh, the the writings, the manuscript writings, correspond exactly uh, to those of Etela's tarot. You know, ta ta Etela uh, yeah. 
produced his own tarot decks, uh, his, his own tarot decks uh, with his own design. But before he did this, he used tarot decks he bought in uh, libraries or shops, uh, which he customized with his own handwriting. And so this deck is one of, according to me, is one of these decks customized by Etela for tarot reading. Really? That'd be pretty cool. Well, he even says in his book, doesn't he, or in somewhere that uh, he was taught by, uh, I believe, Italian uh, gypsies, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, right? Wasn't it? Yeah, or... he talked about the gypsies. Yeah, yeah, he he was taught by them or something. So, I mean, that that's an indication there that it was a, you know, even he admits that you know it was a tradition that was taught to him by by yeah, others. Terenova also talks about uh, a, a slave which he had bought and uh, who who was uh, reading cards for him. So it, it was earlier uh, than than Etela, but. Um, it's a it's a testimony for sure wow this is really really fascinating i thank you so much for doing this and uh i just like i you're welcome to come on my channel anytime you like uh, i really hope you'll come back everybody just thank had you, really man. nice things to say do you have any announcements or anything coming up aside from the book coming out uh anything uh, else that you want to say to no, really, the next uh, next step will be the the publication of the book, uh, which I'm very impatient to to see uh, come out. Uh, and then, uh, no, that's that's the main thing. Uh, I, I I'm also, but it's only Parisian. I also do conferences uh, every two weeks. Uh, I talk about one uh, one tower card. And, uh, at at a, at a con in Paris. In Paris. Shell, yes. Shell David, if you're in Paris, anytime you have to go see him because Shell yeah, Shell sure. is always in in uh, different countries. He travels a lot, so okay. if anybody stopped by Paris, look up uh, Christophe. Well, thank you so much again for doing this. It was an absolute pleasure and an honor. Uh, thank you everybody for joining us. I thank you so much. Uh, today. Thank oh, you it's my it. pleasure. Hang in there until until next time, everybody. Love and peace. Thanks. Thanks for stopping by.